Hello. Hello. Can you see and hear me okay? You're very quiet. Is this a little bit better? In yes. Terms of sound? Much better. Okay. Uh, take it away. We'll bring your slides up. So I need to share my screen using uh, clicking on the Go to top. top of your video. Okay, yeah, I see you. Share yeah. screen. Select window or screen. Uh, Presenting talk P3. Uh, wait a minute. I have a copy, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's there. Allow. Okay. You can see me and hear me and look at the slide? Yes, perfect. All right. All yours. In that case, uh, I will start. So my name is Johan. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, allowing me this, this slot to talk. And I'm going to talk about uh, like brain state dynamics and uh, some of the strategies that we employed to measure these brain states and especially to derive uh, behavioral or like functional significance uh, from them. So the talk basically is comprised of some teams and the first team is uh, some backgrounds uh, followed by then the strategy that we use to infer brain state dynamics uh, and then uh, followed up again by an experiment that we did involving naturalistic movie viewing to figure out uh, with certain different approaches what uh, brain states uh, might mean. So first of all, the brain uh, function has classically been uh, described in the literature um, with brain networks. And each of these networks is like a topology uh, within which uh, the brain signal is associated with a specific function. Well, the strategy to look at this topology uh, or brain signal within these brain regions is uh, to, to use the fMRI signal and to use a parcellation scheme to extract the average time series from all of these different parcels. And then from uh, these time series, you can calculate a correlation matrix. So this is static functional connectivity and it has been employed in the past in fMRI literature quite a lot to look at uh, uh, like differences between patients and controls. Uh, and it has been also used in human connectin project data to figure out if certain connections between brain regions might be more or less associated with certain outcomes of neurobehavioral tests. So in this paper by Stephen Smith that actually analyzes human connectin project data, about 800 uh, people, it appeared that some connections uh, especially the red ones are more associated with positive things like verbal fluency and the like, and the blue connections appear to be more related to negative things such as drug or alcohol abuse. Um, so this topology and this uh, connectivity, uh, so far the, the studies have not yet looked at these dynamics. And dynamic basically means how different the pattern of activity and connectivity changes across time to allow the brain to function. So how to, how to allow the brain to support behavior. So in order to check that, to kind of like go beyond uh, like static functional connectivity, it would be dynamic functional connectivity. It has to be mentioned before. Um, the approach here is to use basically sliding windows and within sliding window, you look at something interesting in the network and you try to track that across time. Uh, yeah. So you can use that, for example, this sliding window to extract uh, interesting properties of 
of the brain. For example, this paper by Amy Zuleski in 2014 looked at efficiency of networks. Uh, and the brain can be here represented uh, as, as like following a sequence of high efficiency states and low efficiency states, where the, the states is represented by a certain topology. Uh, so you have brain signal in distributed regions across the brain that uh, that you like represent the state. Um, sliding windows have also been used uh, by McShine to look at uh, like integratedness uh, or like modularity of the network. And it appears that this modularity is also associated with physiological meaningful parameters such as pupil diameter. So this is like interesting to observe and it's to take a look at. However, there's one issue with the sliding window. And basically you, you, you kind of determine within the sliding, the duration of the sliding window, which in fMRI literature uses like 60 seconds, uh, kind of like one meaningful parameter. So it can only follow kind of like slow moving dynamics. Um, fMRI is already a little bit slow, like the average TR is one second. So you, by using this sliding window, you, you become kind of like blind to maybe faster paced dynamics. And a strategy that we use to apply to uh, circumvent this potential drawback of the sliding window is to use a hidden Markov model. So this allows us to characterize dynamical changes within uh, topology and, and connectivity. And one of the major assumptions of the Hillmark model is that the brain data can be represented as non-random patterns that reoccur throughout time. Uh, so in order to illustrate the approach of the Hillmark model, suppose we have a parcellation of the brain using, for example, you know, 30 brain regions and you expect the average signal in each of these brain regions, you have the signal, and then sliding window-based analysis usually takes this, this window and tracks it throughout time to track something of interest. Instead, with hidden Markov modeling, you try to uh, figure out if there are certain periods in the data that are somehow consistent with each other, and the periods can be disjoint. Um, then, uh, within these, these periods, you, uh, you look at the signal and you look for some kind of common, or you say that this, uh, the properties of the signal need to be common. So within the red periods, the brain topology uh, is consistent and the brain covariance is also consistent. So this is illustrated for only one brain state, but you, if you have the time series, let's say there are three brain states uh, there, and you try to allocate every time point of the time series to one of these three brain states. So the hill Markov model, uh, or use of that, kind of requires you to specify the number of states that you want to have, and also each time point must be allocated to one of these three states. Well, if you do that, then for every state that you specify, you get an emission. So, and you get a covariance. Emission basically means that even though you cannot observe the state itself, what you can observe in the data is how the state is represented. And in this case, the state is represented by both signal across distributed brain regions and by a covariance matrix, which is related to functional connectivity. The major advantage of this is that instead of looking at uh, the variability of signal from brain regions, you can look at the variability of the states themselves. So the, the states no longer are constrained to like 60 seconds. Uh, a state can be visited for the duration of a single fMRI scan. Um, so so you, you can look at these faster brain dynamics. 
you know, the requirements of using the hidden Markov model for fMRI data is that you need to specify your parcellation. So you have a choice depending on your hypothesis, how you are, want to do this. Do you want to look at only one brain region or do you want to look at the whole brain? You need to specify the observation model. So in this case with fMRI data, we say that we want to observe states by looking at the signal within distributed brain regions, the parcellation, and we want to look also at the covariance. And the third major thing is that we must specify the number of the states we want to see. Um, yeah, it sets the major advantages that you can more closely look at these dynamic properties. So how do we look at these dynamic properties? So the first question that we can ask of this state dynamic is how long is each state visited during the scan? This is called fractional occupancy. Uh, I illustrated with a figure here where uh, it's, it's a study on schizophrenia uh, versus healthy controls, analyzing a 14 minute resting state scan uh, where the hidden Markov model was inferred with 12 brain states and uh, 14, a parcellation of 14 whole brain uh, regions. Uh, the fractional occupancy is a percentage score. Uh, so if the total scan is 100%, uh, here we can see that brain states that is labeled high uh, is visited for 10% of the time. Uh, in this study, schizophrenia people were compared with healthy controls and several brain states, uh, especially those that relate to uh, the default point network, are kind of like visited for longer or shorter uh, amount of time. The second thing that we can look at with inner Markov modeling or its dynamic output is to look at the dwell times. So this is basically the answering the questions question, uh, once you are in a certain brain state, how long does it take on average to visit another brain state? Uh, here also in the study of schizophrenia patients with controls, it appears that uh, the states uh, in schizophrenia patients are visited for a bit shorter amount of time. Uh, so the states are, are less uh, sticky. Then a third thing to take a look at is uh, transition probabilities. So using a state transition matrix, we can look at the probability that once you are in brain set one, how likely are you to change to brain set two, brain set three, or brain set four? So this is not a symmetric uh, matrix. It's actually uh, like a bi-directional uh, difference. Um, we see from the schizophrenia study that there is a difference between patients and controls in these brain state dynamics. Uh, you can further analyze this, this transition probabilities by looking at the top 20% of the transitions. This is looking more like quantitatively at these dynamics, uh, but you can also use graph network analysis like network-based statistics to figure out if there are some transitions that are statistically significantly more probable than uh, like other transitions. So, um, these, these uh, brain state dynamics, when uh, analyzed from a human connectome project dataset uh, by Diego in PNS, um, basically show that if you look at resting states of the healthy controls and if you infer a hidden mark model with 12 brain states, there appear to be two meta states. So two sets of brain states that like to visit each other more. Uh, here it appears that like there's a, a meta state. And then if you spend more time visiting these brain states, you score higher on a, a neurocognitive uh, test battery of anger and aggression, kind of like negative things. 
Um, there's also another meta state, and if you dwell, people who tend to dwell more in this second meta state tend to do uh, better on uh, positive things like maybe life satisfaction, or processing speed, cognitive flexibility, and the like. So again, here there is a behavioral mm, uh, relevant uh, analogy of these brain states that's being reported in literature. Um, so this is very interesting. Uh, however, most of these behavioral traits are either comparing patients versus controls or, or uh, or behavior has been assessed using some kind of a neurocognitive test. And we don't really know what's happening during the scan. And we can't really know because most of these uh, scans use like a resting state scan. And during resting state, people are not really doing much. Of course, resting state is, is interesting because all kinds of different processes are going on, but we think there are more like intrinsic processes and not so much uh, brain function that deals with interpreting the outside world and what's happening there. Um, so we wanted to externally drive the system and then look at these brain state dynamics. And the way we went about doing that is by presenting a movie uh, to the participants and ask them to take a look at it. And then we uh, passively measure the brain with fMRI. So the major advantage of this approach is that we can use basically the exact same kind of analysis used for resting state uh, for the movie analysis. And we can compare the resting state situation with the movie dynamic situation. And then during movie viewing, we are in a slightly better position to try to answer uh, what is the functional significance of the brain state. Uh, are the dynamics like really intrinsic or do they tend to be more externally imposed and also uh, important question about brain cell dynamics is are they reproducible or not so what uh, what we did was uh, ask subjects to come in uh, they underwent an eight minute resting state scan this was followed by looking at a short movie that was selected for like its evocative contents um, the movie lasted about 20 minutes uh, and then we asked the same people to come back. Actually, for the first movie, movie viewing session, we had 18 participants, but uh, only 14 of the participants came back after three months. Um, we also measured heart rate and pupil diameter. Um, and we analyzed the data with the HMM MAR toolbox which I show a link to uh, in, in this GitHub website. It's a really nice toolbox uh, with pretty good documentation on how to go about doing uh, hidden Markov model analysis. So this design puts us in a pretty good position to at least uh, like answer the reproducibility question of these brain state analysis. So, for using the HMM, we need to look at the parcellation strategy. In this case, we chose to use a parcellation using 14 whole brain networks uh, that have been reported in previous literature to encode for a wide variety of cognitive function. Uh, we used this approach because we wanted to look at whole brain dynamics uh, while watching the movie. In terms of observation model, we said, okay, look, we want the model to, per, to give us the average signal within each of these 14 brain regions. Um, and we also want to measure uh, the covariance. And we want to infer 10 brain states. So if we do that, uh, we basically concatenate the data. So in this, uh, 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 graph you see rest and movie and then again rest and movie we concatenated the data from these four scans and then we concatenated the, all of the subjects in one big time series and this was the input of the hidden Markov model 
So the output of the inner Markov model is the average bolt signal in these 14 brain regions. And I represent this in a brain image and also represent this in uh, is these bars, where these bars basically correspond to which of these brain networks you're looking at. Uh, a signal of zero means that the activity was the average activity across the entire uh, scanning session and uh, red indicates a higher activity and blue indicates a lower activity compared to the average. So this is brain set one, uh, we have 10 brain states. If we see that the, there's a uh, yeah, quite a bit of variability between the different brain states in terms of how they are loaded to the network. You see also that there are some states that are relatively more closer to the average signal uh, intensity or the average bolt signal, and that's especially state five and state nine. Um, so these are the brain states. Uh, and then the question that we had was like, look, okay, this Patterns are interesting. Uh, people are watching a movie. Could we try to derive some kind of a meaning from, from this pattern? Uh, how we went about that was using uh, the Remuracent approach. So this is a really interesting paper by uh, Yoconi. It's a while back already. Uh, basically, uh, you look at the entire body of fMRI literature and you try to analyze within all the published papers certain keywords. You try to associate that to reported like bold activity, reported, reported bold signal within the paper. So using these thousands upon thousands of, of studies, you can try to do a forward inference. So you can say like, look, if I have the word pain look at the body of the fast body of literature and try to make a probabilistic map of like, oh, here is a brain signal that is related to pain, according to the literature. You can also try to use a reverse inference. So once you have a pattern of both activity like across the whole brain, what is the probability that certain kind of keywords are, uh, are written up in the paper? Um, so if you do that for brain set one, uh, we load, uh, we try to figure out this, this like, a, like a probability of uh, keywords that are related to the movie, such as emotion perception, face perception, uh, conflict, uh, like negative and positive uh, valence. So we see kind of like a, a pattern of according to uh, meta-analysis, uh, like meaning behind uh, the pattern of brain set one. We did this for the other states as well. Um, and even though it is a bit exploratory, at least we, we do see that uh, every brain state is represented by a different functional profile. So this, this neurosynth, I also posted a link to the GitHub page there, is Kind of interesting to, to try to figure out uh, one way of deriving a, a functional significance. So that's not the only thing that we did. Uh, we also looked at the brain state paths. So here you basically see a representation of the time spent in resting state, which is about eight minutes, and the time spent in movie, which is about 20, 19 and a half minutes. Every functional fMRI data uh, volume has been labeled with being occupied by brain set one or two or three or four etc um, so you you can already see that during the resting state uh, states tend to be visited for a slightly longer amount of time and between the participants there is not super much consistency whereas during movie viewing there seem to be more brain states visited um, and participants seem to be qu sometimes quite consistent in the brain states that they are actually visiting. I try to assess this consistency in visited brain states with a percentage score. Uh, 
uh, and also try to label what was the most visited brain state, so this brain state was actually consistent. So during resting state, because there are like kind of like two main brain states that are visited, uh, the, the consistency is about 50%, whereas in movie viewing, the consistency reaches like 100% for many of these time points. So this is the first movie viewing session. There's also the second movie viewing session. Uh, and we see that after three months, uh, the people, they come back. And we see that this uh, less consistency that we have in resting states during the first session is, is repeated in the second resting state session. But the consistency that we have in the first movie viewing is repeated also during the second movie viewing. Um, we also un performed several control analysis where we checked only the resting state as input to the Hindemarkov model. And we checked only the moving viewing data in the Hindemarkov model. Uh, and we like cropped the movie viewing data that's now 20 minutes to eight minutes and put that in the hidden market model to at least control for the fact that the movie viewing is longer. So whatever that we did, these, these results that are uh, described remain consistent. So another thing that we had was an independent movie expert looking at the movie and annotating the time points where certain plot events happens. He wrote them up together with the time. Uh, so we have a set of annotations. I'll just show uh, like the first few of them. Um, and our analysis basically show that uh, when everybody was like visiting, in this case, for example, state three, this happened in fMRI time at around like seven minutes in the movie. And the annotation uh, and we see this throughout the annotations, so the timings of them are remarkably consistent. Mm, so we have other annotations as well. Uh, we have the presence of faces, positive and negatively valence downloaded in the movie. We have also positive and negative scenes. We have like language, use of language, and uh, another thing is change point. This is basically when the movie uh, like the image that you see changes from one setting to another setting. We can look at these brain state paths here, uh, like color coded, uh, but every state has its own state path that you see here. Uh, and we compare this with these annotations. And you can calculate, because there are two binary vectors of zero and one, we calculate an overlap. You can also make a null distribution. So by randomly shuffling uh, one of these uh, vectors, in this case, state paths, you can do this uh, like 5,000 times, and then you have like a null distribution of overlaps, and then you can compare your observed overlap with the null distribution. So in this, uh, using this method, we found that there are uh, many brain states are actually statistically significantly uh, corresponding to movie annotations. So what about fractional occupancy? So this is questions like throughout the movie or throughout the racing state, how long was the brain state visited? So during movie viewing, there are several brain states, for example, one, two, three, four, uh, six, seven, and eight that are visited like significantly more uh, than uh, during resting state. And during resting state, there are some brain states that are visited significantly more uh, during movie viewing. Uh, in terms of dwell times, this doesn't read statistical significance, but the trend is uh, still there. Mm. So if we look at the transition probability, Again, this is uh, with a matrix, you try to quantify that if you are in a certain brain state, what's the probability of visiting any of the other brain states? Uh, 
uh, we see different profiles during REST 68 and movie viewing. Uh, the top 20% uh, connection look different, and if you use network based statistics to look at statistically significant differences between REST and movie, we see that movie viewing is characterized by kind of like a, a group of states that like to visit each other more, whereas caressing states was, was more uh, dominated by transitions between brain states 9 and sort of 5. So, kind of like in summary, the brain states are functionally significant, uh, as shown with the neurosynthal prowess and also as shown with the uh, annotations. Um, during movie viewing, the brain state dynamics are seem to be driven by the movie content, and they are different than uh, as found in resting state. And the brain states are also, or the brain state dynamics are highly reproducible. So it's it's interesting to to look at these brain state dynamics. But uh, what about what's happening during the movie? Uh, so we, we try to assess this um, by looking at the, the subject's subjective movie impressions that they had as assessed with the questionnaire that they undertook after the movie. So the questionnaire that we used was uh, consisted of these four questions uh, and everybody answered them. So the first question is, is it bored? Like not at all very bored. How well did you enjoy the movie viewing? How emotional did you feel? And what was the audio quality for you? Um, if you do uh, a PCA kind of analysis on these uh, questionnaire answers, you can kind of like find a group of people that had more engagement in the movie and uh, some of the people that had less engagement in the movie. So basically these guys were totally into it or they maybe didn't like it or, or were somehow other otherwise uh, distracted. Mm. So we wanted to, you, so, so this, this represents kind of like a variability in the subject movie, subjective movie experience. We wanted to correlate or correspond this to brain state dynamics. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like difficult, or I wouldn't know how to do this in terms of like a direct relationship, because it's like apples and pears. Um, so there's an, a way that's called uh, representational similarity analysis to try to do that. So instead of asking what's the direct relationship, we ask, are they similarly represented? In this case, the representation of, for example, brain activity data is a matrix where on the X you have participants, on the Y you also have participants, the same participants, and the matrix elements represent the distance in terms of their movie, movie questionnaire answers. So you have one of these matrix, you have such a matrix for brain activity data, and you have also such a matrix for the behavioral data, because then the matrix elements represent uh, like the, the difference in uh, fractional occupancy. And then you can compare these two matrices. And this is like a really nice way to kind of like look at similarity in representation of brain activity data and behavioral data. And it can also be used to like look at like the behavioral uh, relevance of, of the outcome of computational models. Um, so the representation of our questionnaire answers is basically given by this distance matrix where the only important elements are the lower triangular part. Uh, and again, where each of these uh, values represents a distance from, uh, for example, subject 13 versus subject 2. Uh, so this is the behavioral representation. We also have these dynamic representations, for example, the, the difference in the fractional occupancy between the participants, uh, and another dynamic representation, which is like the difference in the subject-specific 
brain state transition matrix. So if two subjects have, have one of those, then this represents the distance between the subjects in terms of their uh, brain state dynamics. Um, when we try to like figure out if these matrices are similar, uh, we use like permutation testing uh, to form a null distribution and compare our observed correlation with the null correlation. We do find significant uh, correlations between the questionnaire representation and fractional occupancy representation. And we also find significant correlation between the questionnaire and the state transition. So in this way, we do observe that uh, like the, the, the way people are switching their brain states actually means something in terms of how they um, evaluate and how they process the movie. So conclusions, um, yeah, brain states, they represent intrinsic and ex also, but also externally imposed states. Um, brain states have a functional relevance. Uh, brain state dynamics, they are really different between rest and movie. They do relate to movie impression and they are highly reproducible. So I think movie viewing is, is really an interesting approach and has many additional benefits than to using resting state because you, you kind of like impose something that the participants can actually look at and, and need to process. And this might be interesting actually for like mental health assessments of uh, brain function. Um, because instead of measuring probably more intrinsic processes in the brain, you can maybe with a set of movie try to capture different aspects of the brain where it's actually it's trying to mm, process uh, external events. And that might be uh, yeah, interesting for uh, mental health. That's also other kinds of research. Um, okay, that was it. I'd like to thank my collaborators and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Johan. Yeah.